G'day everyone, Justin from uh, First National Bundaberg. We've got the Property Pulse uh, podcast today. Uh, we've got a special guest here, Jason from My Castle Lending. Hi all. So Jason basically helps us get uh, finance for potential buyers uh, of our properties. Uh, so we just send send any potential buyers across to Jason. Jason helps them out. So what Jason's going to be talking today about what you, the buyer, needs to have in place to get your investment property up and running, even your first property. But today we're sort of going on from what we spoke about last week about negative gearing. Um, and we just want to make sure that People aren't getting confused about that topic of negative gearing with buying an investment property and how it all sort of works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, I'm a real estate agent. I have no idea about the finance side of things. I just go talk to Jason and hard <laughs> So essentially, first things first, yep. we do our random question. I'll just take Let's it out. Oh, this is really random. Is love at first sight something you believe in? No. There we go. No. Lust, uh, yes, not love. Love is something you have to build to. Fair enough. I, I would have to agree with that. <laughs> that was a nice, easy first question, random question. So, <laughs> all right, let's move on. Um, so, yeah, basically, uh, buyer comes to Justin and says, hey, I want to buy my first investment property. What do I need to do? Um, I say, well... Here's the contract sign on the dotted line. No. You worry about the finance. No, no, please don't do that to me. No. <laughs> so essentially what we do is we will send them your way. Yeah, so if someone's looking to buy an investment property, there is a lot of things you have to consider because it's not just as simple of a minus your current debts equals the amount of cash flow you've got to buy to purchase the property. Mm -hmm. You've got your negative gearing you have to consider. You've got just cash flow constraints. Yep. Um, just because you live off a certain amount doesn't mean the banks will actually work on that as well. Okay. They do work with something called HEM, Household Expenditure Measure, which is basically what their minimum living expenses are. So even though you might be a really good budgeter, if you're actually lower than that figure, yep. they will actually bring you up to that figure, which okay. means all your calculations could have gone out the window. Right, yeah. Okay. So do, with that, do they, they take in, say, if you've got uh, kids... In the Absolutely. Household. How many yeah. dependents, yeah. how many adults, all oh, that kind of fun stuff. So that asks questions like how much you spend on groceries per week. So the cost of living is definitely going to 100%. Um, have an effect on how much you can borrow. Yep. As um, well as what the actual investment property is going to cost you as well. Okay. So the future expenses, insurances, yep. Yep. Uh, rates, double rates. The lenders will also sometimes buffer how much actually rent you get. So okay. instead of actually, say for example, you're going to get a property that's going to pay $500 in rent, they'll actually take 20% off that. Okay. Um, just for a buffer rate. Is that, is that 20%? Is that sort of to cover um, property management fees, insurance rates? Lack of tenancy. Lack of tenancy, etc. Yeah. Okay. Things of that nature. That's oh, so 20%. That's, that's yeah, right. it's not hard and fast across all yeah. lenders. Again, that's reasons why most people speak with a broker for because instead of going to one lender and just dealing with whatever they've got, mm. a broker's got all the different lenders with all the different policies. So it's not trying to fit what you want into someone's policies. Yes, yeah, yeah. You actually tell the broker what you want. It's the broker's job to go out there and actually find it within so all the to, different lenders. Trying to get the square peg into a square hole opposed to the square peg into the round hole. That's exactly it. Okay. okay. And so, there's a lot of different things we have to consider. So if, capital gains is something you do want to go for, then yep. your servicing is probably going to be the biggest draw card. Mm. Okay, mm. how much servicing do you have? Do you have the ability to service the extra debt? Um, then if, if that's not the case and you want to go for something a little bit more different where it's cash flow, you're going for something that's giving you a better cash flow, then you might not get the equity gains out yep. of it. So there's those types of structures and strategies that you want to consider. You want to make sure you've got those things clear inside your own head on what you want from the investment property or from the property in general. Mm. Um, a lot of people want to purchase the property but don't think 10, 15 years down the track. Well, that's that's understandable and you sort of, like, like I see a lot of people come to me and go, well, you know, we're, we're being pre-approved by the bank. It's, and that's fine, that's, that's all good. But as far as I'm concerned, being 
pre-approved by the bank doesn't really mean Unfortunately anything. not. Uh, it has changed. It used yeah. to be perfect. They used to give, give you what I class as a fully assessed pre-approval, yeah. which means they've looked at your entire application, looked at the servicing, looked at the um, debts, all the rest of it, yeah. and gone, yep, all we need now is a property. You find us a property that meets this criteria, yep. which is where you're kind of budgeting to buy, these are pre-approval. So it's literally conditionally approved subject to one thing, which is the property. Yep. So they order a valuation. Even though you're buying, you've got a contract, they will still send out a valuer. Um, the valuation comes back as long as it meets what you're buying it for. They tick that off. You've got your no full, problems, full yeah. formal approval. Okay. Nice easy done. But about two to three years ago when the big property boom happened, um, mm. <laughs> the banks got overwhelmed. Now, the yeah. banks have about a 40% strike rate on pre-approvals. So for Okay. Every 10, only four of them actually go ahead. So when they got overwhelmed, they basically culled that side of their business. Wow. Okay, so they just stopped pre-approving. Yeah. They still did the pre-approvals, but all they did is ran it through an algorithm that checked on servicing. Yep. So you can put in any details. You can put into any service. Are the banks going to lend me 500 but when they actually go to the bank and say, hey, your system said I can borrow 500 the bank goes, hold on a second, can you give me all your paperwork? Or oh, actually, no, you can only borrow 300 because of, of um, your lending ability yep. or your, your uh, ability to pay back. Um, Although I still have all the paperwork because mm -hmm. under a conditional approval, I still have to submit everything to the yeah, lender. Yeah. They just don't pick it up. They just don't look at it. Okay. Um, they'll literally just run through an algorithm until we can provide them with the property. Right. Once you provide them with that contract of sale, then they'll pick everything up and start assessing it in its, in its entirety. And, that, and, that's, and that's when things can come from. That's like where that. it becomes <laughs> quite painful for a real estate agent. Uh, you know, so when, when someone goes, I've got pre-approval, I, I, as a, an agent, generally say, okay, well, that's nice to know that you've taken that first step, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean a great deal to me mm. until the contract's drawn up, the finance clause is... Unconditional. Unconditional. And signed off, yep. Yep, until the bank essentially writes, writes the check out and goes... There you go, yeah. um, until that point. But <clears throat> going back a little bit, because um, I, I feel that a lot of people go onto the bank website and type in, mm -hmm. you know, what can I borrow? And the bank throws out the algorithm, hey, this is how much you can borrow. Would it be better for a buyer to sort of go to a broker like yourself first mm -hmm. and go, here's all my paperwork, what can you do for me? Yep. And then you go, well, I've got a lender that can do X, Y, Z, or mm -hmm. another one that can do da, 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 da. Now you go find a property. Yep. Would that be a better way of doing it than finding a property? It's a smoother way for a client. <laughs> so from your client's point of view, the, the best way is to be prepared. Yep. So yes, we can go to you first, find the property first, and then get flicked over to the lender. Uh, sorry, I broke it myself, sorry. Now, that can be perfectly fine, yep. okay? But if there's any hiccups along the way, uh, and this could be a thousand different things, it could be something as simple as, oh, what's one I've seen recently? Uh, a payslip still in the maiden name. Mm. Um, because they got married three years ago, now wanted to buy, purchase their own property, yep. uh, and the payslip's still in the maiden name. So we have to go through the whole process of trying to get that change with their employer, now, if they come to me with a 14-day finance clause... It's going to be an issue. It's going to be a big issue because I can't even submit it to the lenders to even start the process until I've got that up-to-date payslip, which means I'm then waiting <laughs> for the employer... To which, do their thing. Yeah, so... All of a sudden, that clause gets blown out and yep. solicitors rub their hands together because they're getting more money. Yep, asking um, for extensions. Yeah, asking and, for extensions. And this puts up, starts putting bad taste in the seller's mm -hmm. mouth as well as the buyer's now starting to stress. So yeah. I'm a big fan of... If you're ever looking at buying a property, come and see a broker. Okay, we'll sit down with you. Our services are generally free. Okay, we very rarely charge a client specifically for the work okay. that we do. Okay, the banks are the ones that pay us when we take their loan to them. Yep. All right. So, our services are generally free. Come and have a chat with us. We'll sit down with you. We'll go through what you do have, what you don't have, what you can clean up. Little things like I don't know if anyone's well, most people have them, but GE credit cards and so forth. Cool. The old things that you buy from 10 years ago yeah. that you put some furniture on, interest-free, 
they forgot, or forget, or didn't even know that it's actually a credit card sitting on your credit file. Yeah. Um, you may not have a card attached to it, you may not even ever used it again, but it's still sitting there. So when I go to do a credit check, or the bank goes to do a credit check, you might have a ten, fifteen thousand dollar credit card there that you don't wow. need, don't don't use. But a ten thousand dollar credit card can literally change your servicing capacity by about fifty thousand dollars under the current rates. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. and that could be the difference between getting a property and not getting that property. So. Those little things can come time sometimes, and then so, you've got the added pressure of trying to close them down. Someone who's got that G credit card or the store credit card or whatever, um, and they've literally forgotten about them, how do they find out and be able to close them down? Generally, I will let them know. Okay. Because when I'm doing an actual application, I actually have to do a credit check. Yep. I have to find out from my point of view for the banks, what other debts do this client have? Mm. Okay, so they might not be telling me everything. And the banks are very cautious people, so they will run their own checks as well. Yep. But if I don't let the bank know up front that they've got this debt, the banks are instantly think, what else are they hide? What else are they not telling me about this? Yeah. And yep. then the whole process slows down a little bit. And then they start going through everything with a fine tooth code. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Asking for statements. Look, you've six months saving statements. We want to see every single transaction that you do now. Um, where most lenders don't require that, mm. but if they feel like they're getting the wool pull over their eyes, you know, start words, asking. get all your stuff together, mm. talk to the broker, make sure that you're being upfront as much as possible. You know, I've I've probably got a dozen credit cards that I don't Everyone know about. <laughs> don't know about, and uh, I think I've got most of them closed off. But uh, if you don't don't check, then you're mm. never going to know, and uh, that investment property and, and most people want to get an investment property if they can so and it's just life like when you've got a bit extra cash going so forth the banks are more than happy to throw the credit cards at you and you start increasing the limits you may never use them mm. like i've dealt with clients that have had 30 40 thousand dollars worth of credit cards they're sitting there just don't, don't need them don't you but they've got access to it yeah it still goes against your so when i try to do a servicing calculator on them the banks are using them as being fully drawn because they yeah. can be well, that's true. Uh, so if you have a ten thousand dollar credit card that's got a zero balance, you get your finance approved. The very next day, you can go re up ten thousand dollars worth of furniture. Yeah. So the banks have to take those kinds of things into consideration. So, so if you don't need it though, drop it off. Get rid of it. Credit it's cards. Only... Credit cards are, are not very good for anything apart from the banks, mm. and uh, it's just their way of making a little bit of extra money out of you. Yep. Uh, and there's definitely better good. options. Oh, there's yeah. definitely better options. If you've got a home or you're buying a home and you've, well, if you get a home, you can use your equity, mm. which is generally the cheapest interest rate you're going to get for those short-term funding yeah. issues. Like if you, you don't use credit cards because you want to, no. sometimes there's points available and so forth. Yeah, that yeah. Get uh, flyby's points a different way. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, essentially, it's very interesting, like, um, especially from being on my side of the aisle, so to speak, uh, uh, we don't really see what happens on your side. We just get the phone call going. Uh, the bank is being a little bit slow with the finance. We're going to have to ask for an extension. Um, it's the last thing we want to see. It's the last thing the seller wants to see. And obviously, it's the last thing the buyer wants to see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, I do believe first port of call is not the real estate. Yep. It's the broker. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, if you save yourself 10 minutes there, that could essentially save you weeks and weeks of stress and heartache trying to go through to buy that investment property. Don't worry, I've, I've got, you know, properties that I can sell you, no worries at all. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't got the finance to get it across the line, you're just sort of wasting a lot of time. Yeah. Not not just my time, you're wasting the seller's time you know, you, and, and the bank's time as well. Mm. So, Well, I'm, most people that are buying an investment property, especially an investment property, not just their first property, but their mm. investment property, they generally have a fairly good surplus of income. Yeah. Okay, so they don't normally feeling the pressures of cash loan and so forth of that nature, which generally means that their existing home loan might not be on the best rate as well. So again, if they reach out to a broker beforehand, the broker might be able to get them onto a better rate for their existing debt, yep. which will then free up more servicing for their investment debt. Uh, because well, that's, there you go. Variable, people are on variable interest rates at the present stage. They 
could be around six to seven percent, okay. sometimes higher. Mm. Um, there's actually options out there at the present stage that can get you as low as 5.39 under a fixed rate, wow. okay. which is extremely low. Uh, and I do know that we're going down to a, a, a lowering of interest rates cycle now. Yep. We're probably not going to keep going up. We're probably going to plateau off or start falling down. Uh -huh. But how fast it falls and so forth, that's still a really good rate. So by changing your, your existing loan to a better interest rate now, you're actually opening up your servicing. Yep. for that investment yep. property, so you're not feeling the financial pressure once yep. you do take on that extra debt and that extra commitment. So ultimately, with, with interest rates, and that's another hot topic that everyone's talking about, mm. is, it's you know, is, <laughs> is is the RBA going to drop the um, rates in November, or are they going to wait till next year? Um, I feel that a lot of savvy investors are just sitting there watching and waiting and seeing and you know obviously we all know the interest rates go up interest rates go down they don't they're not always going to be down low and they're not always going to be up high yeah um i've got a feeling that november they're gonna do a cut mm -hmm. um, i could be completely wrong but i did say last year that end of this year they would do a cut yep. um now i'm seeing sort of they're sort of going to play it safe for a little bit longer mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that uh, i have to admit my crystal ball did break a few years ago so i am just going off my gut at this point in time but my way of looking at it is i watch the banks yep. and i watch what they're doing with their interest rates because no offense I don't get paid millions of dollars to make sure the banks don't lose any money. Yeah. I'm just an everyday broker. Yeah. So I don't have the tools and resources that those guys do. But if I can see that the banks are starting to lower their fixed rates like they are now, I believe that they believe that they're the rates are going to go down. They're getting ready. They're getting ready for it. It's so okay. Yeah. They think it's going to go down. So it's probably going to get how fast it goes down and where it goes. That's fool's ask question. Yeah, you, you, no, no one knows. No one knows, yeah. That, um, that's understandable. But, but there's also strategies to fix that as well. Mm. So again, this is where the broker can come sometimes yeah. help because little things like hedging your, your loan. So instead of having one really big loan for an investment, you might want to hedge it so we actually split it down the middle. And you okay. might have one of it being fixed so you can you know cash flow wise that's not going to change. Yep. And then you might have a variable split which will change. Okay. And then you can yeah there's lots of those types of structures. Yeah, okay. that helped with that. Wow. Um, that's, <laughs> I don't want to get too complex. I'm not, I'm that's, not that's a lot of information <laughs> and we only got a limited time to talk about. But, you know, it's great to see that um, the possibilities to be able to um, get that investment property under your belt are there. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't just go to the first big bank to get your loan because they, they may give you the loan, but it's probably not going to be at the best rate. If you're a circle and you go to a bank that's a circle, you're going to fit. Okay, you're going to fill in within their policies. Yeah. The only thing with a broker is we've got a very wide variety of lenders, mm. generally speaking. Mm. Anything from your top, top tiers all the way down to your non conformings. So if you've got a self employed person who's just started up and wasn't yeah. quite there, they go to the big banks, big banks going, eh, not really up our cup of tea. Not this interested. Is, this is not within our policy. Yeah, yeah. Um, because that's where it comes down to, is every bank has slightly different policies. Okay. And it's the way they manage their risk. So you might have one lender that has a policy for self-employed people that will allow them to do one-year financials. Okay. But then they won't lend in postcodes like 4660. Okay, where they'll only lend in more major areas. Yeah. Or you've got other lenders that will do exactly the opposite. They'll lend in this other areas, but they'll have a slightly higher interest rate to try to Bounce manage out. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's all those little things that brokers help with. Well, again, what I'd say is don't just go straight to the big bank. Go talk to a broker. Mm. Um, a broker works for you at yeah. the end of the day. We don't but work for the banks. If, if you are that circle peg that can go to Westpac, for example, and they're the circle... The broker's going to end up going, well, you know what, you fit there anyway, mm. push you into that direction. Um, but if you're not quite circle enough for Westpac, you could potentially go, well, um, the Commonwealth Bank may be the way of going, or mm. hang on a second, the, the big four are just not going to help you out as well as they should. If you're rate conscious, yeah. the big four generally aren't the top ones to go for yeah so because they can, are too big they yeah. deal with their name yeah so you could potentially go to a, a second tier yep. which may have a better rate 
more a little bit more flexible with their loan ability, mm. uh, lending you um, or getting you into your property sooner and quicker. Yep. Um, but from a broker's point of view, you're going to be looking at all the different lenders that could potentially fit the client. That's exactly right. So one of the conversations I have with my clients is what are their goals mm. is the easiest way to go. And out of those goals, there'll be different ones that have higher and lower priority. Yep. So if someone says to me, okay, I want an offset account, but I won't pay no annual fees. Okay, which one's more important to you? Okay, well, I've got $20,000 that I know I'm not going to need. I want to drop that and do an offset account, but I don't pay annual fees. Okay, well, to get an offset account, generally, you'll have to pay an annual fee. Yeah. Okay, if you're going to get $20,000 in an offset account, it's going to give you this type of savings versus an annual fee that might cost you $250 a year. Yeah. Is it best to get four thousand dollars worth of interest savings and pay a two hundred fifty thousand two hundred fifty dollar fee, or not have that four thousand dollars savings and not have the fee? Yeah. Okay. What's in your best interest? Best interest is going for the offset account, paying yeah. that annual fee. So the savings have got the high priority. Okay. And those are the conversations that I have to have with the clients right. because very rarely am I ever going to tick every single box. So I have the conversation with clients. Clients tell me what they want. They they mm. If I know from the very outset that this is not going to happen, then I'll educate them and let them okay. know, and, okay, this is what we can and can't do within the industry. Yep. What would be more preferable to you? And just finding that out. All right, so just use myself as an example. I come to you and say, hey, I own my house outright. Mm -hmm. um, I've got the ability to sort of market my property to be able to go, well, this is how much it's going to sell for in the marketplace, generally pretty close to what the banks would appraise it for. When I come to you and say, hey, my house is worth $800,000, for example. Yep. I don't have a mortgage on it. I don't owe anything on it, but I'm looking to purchase a, a property. Mm -hmm. um, I am self-employed. Um, what would you need from me to start the ball rolling to for me to be able to go, hey, I'd like to buy my first investment property. Mm -hmm. Yep. From what you've just said, everything is covered from the deposit point of view because you've got the equity within your yep. existing home. So a deposit isn't going to be a question I have to ask. Yep. It's going to come down to servicing. Okay. So I'm going to sit there and go, okay, look, send us over your financials. Let me run through a servicing calculator. I'll come back to you with what your maximum limit will be. Uh, based off that information, then you can go, okay, let's go look at the market and find out what I can buy for that yeah. range. Yeah. Okay, because I can do the servicing calculators exactly the same as the banks can, because I use their calculators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, the benefit of being a broker, they can give us all that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, we can, we can tell from the very get-go whether or not you're going to be able to afford it or not. Okay. Uh, and that's one of the things that I like from my clients. When they're looking to purchase a property, being an investment or their first property or whatever it may be, come and see us first. Let's sit down, we'll have a chat, look at all the different aspects of your life, including yep. what credit cards you've got stored in the background, <laughs> what incomes do you have, yep. what income can I use compared to what I can't use. How many kids you got, how many dogs you got, yeah. how many horses, if you've got horses, forget about getting a, getting <laughs> a home loan. Yeah, um, so those little things. Yeah. I look at every client's personal situation and then make the call from there. Okay. Okay, it's not one size fits all, that's, those days are long and truly gone. And unfortunately, yeah. that's where a lot of the banks still sit. They've got their way of doing it, one size that fits all. Okay. If you don't fit within that, sorry, you don't. Too bad. Yeah. Even if you're a smidge out, they're just, no. Very rare, Not they'll learn. Yeah. Okay. There, right. there is exemptions, don't get me wrong, there's always exemptions. Yeah. Um, so, for, for, for example, um, I'll, I'll use my, well, I've got my house that's 800, I've got no money owing on it, I've got a couple of credit cards, for example, um, and... You know, I'm looking at buying a, uh, an investment property for $500,000 and I want to go with Westpac. Yep. Um, and I'm just using Westpac as, a, yep. no, as, a, as an example. Would Westpac, because I'm self-employed or considered as self-employed, um, would they... Like as a big bank, and I shouldn't really use Westpac as an example. I should just <laughs> it's use perfectly one, fine. One of the big big banks. <laughs> exactly. um, would I be jumping through more hoops to get a loan with Westpac or Commonwealth Bank or NAB, being in my position, or would I? Would you go listen the big banks because you are a, a 
self-employed uh, business owner, you're better off going down into the next year and then sort of working that way. Yep. Yes and no. So it does come down to, again, the person situation. So yep. if you're self-employed but you're, you own a company yep. and you pay yourself a wage from that company, uh, there's actually lenders out there that have multiple ways of assessing you. Okay. Okay. So again, we don't don't like using names and so forth. Yeah. But I will have to drop a name this time. CBA, for example. Yeah. CBA have two policies for self-employed: full verification or pay slips only. Okay. They will actually allow you to use your pay slips from your company business only as evidence to get the loan. Uh -huh. You don't actually need to go through the full company financials to just show. to get a loan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That works. Where a lot of the other ones will yeah. make you do that. So those little policy differences is what I'm looking for. So if a client comes to me and says, oh, look, yeah, the company's doing okay, but we had a big hit last year. Mm. Okay, so we didn't show any profits. But their pay slips are enough to service, sure. yeah, their pay slips are enough to service the debt. Okay. Then I'll go, okay, well, let's not go to a lender that actually does look at your pay slips as well as your company. Let's just go with the lender that looks at your mm. pay slips only. They don't need to look at that, so we won't show them that. Okay. Well, that's, and that's good to know. Yeah. And that's the, it's a small policy difference between the different banks. Mm. It's finding what works best for the client. That's, the, at the end of the day, the broker's job. Yeah, and that's, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, you've, you've brought up a lot of uh, great points when it comes to um, wanting to get into an investment property uh, or even a first home. Uh, as I said before, it's, mm. it's something that I don't, necessarily know or think about when we're doing the contracts up or trying to get the buyer to pay more for a property um, obviously you need to talk to a broker before you come or start looking at houses uh, the broker will point you in the right direction what you can do if lots you want, of tools as well yeah yeah and what you can do um, if you, if you are interested in more information, uh, go into the our, um, comment section and we'll have a link there to Jason. Um, give him a call, sit down, have a chat. That's the best thing we can do. Yep. Um, and once, once Jason has said, yes, we can do this for you, then you can give me a call and uh, we can sort of work out what we can do for you and how we can get you into that investment property or get you into your first home. Yeah, absolutely. Because being prepared is the key. Because once you're prepared, I've been able to have someone purchase a property or sign a contract on a Wednesday. And because we've already done everything previously and I've gone with a lender that has a fast turnaround time in regards to applications, yeah. they can actually have the approval within about two to three days. Oh, nice. So the 14-day finance laws or the 21-day finance laws that people think, they don't have to be there all the time. You can actually satisfy it within a few days if you're prepared. As, as long as you've got all your... Instead of asking for extensions... Yeah, it's done. Yeah, you're getting, done. getting to the formal approval stage really, really quickly. The only thing I worry about is the building your best and make sure that that's all done and dusted. Absolutely. But anyway, we're, we've come to the end of uh, the property pulse this week, and I must say thank you very much, Jason, for no coming in and uh, uh, giving us all those beautiful gems on getting a, a loan. Oh, there's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> there's a thousand different topics there's, to have a conversation so we'll about. Definitely, so. We'll definitely uh, bring you back in and we'll go through some more. Yep. Uh, but yeah, at this stage, again, we'll, we'll have all your details in the comment section so if you want to get in contact if you are looking to uh, finance or get finance get in contact with Jason uh, from my castle lending uh, and then give Justin from First National a call and we'll try and get you into your investment property absolutely sounds good all right thank, thank you, you very much. much talk to you soon bye now